Hello and welcome to this review of my HP 8660B. This thing is part of a signal generator and oscilloscope unit. It's very old, I found records of it in a page from a HP booklet from as early as 1971. Obviously, a unit like this is a bit hard to review in my standard format, but I'm going to try nonetheless because the keyboard in this is definitely interesting enough to warrant some spotlight time. The 8660 family of synthesized signal generators was conceived as a hybrid solution to tackle the usual necessity of getting both a synthesizer and a signal generator, which at that point were normally sold as separate devices. This one promised to combine the stability, programmability and frequency resolution of a synthesizer and the modulation and voltage calibration of a high quality signal generator. Apart from a bunch of specs, there's a whole page with old school pictures of oscilloscope-like readouts for demonstration, which looks pretty cool. I'd been on the lookout for one of these for a while, as it uses a very intriguing type of switch that I don't think has been spotted in anything else yet, HP Pulse Transformers. Now this is probably the most complicated switch I've encountered to date, so I was rather mystified at first, but thankfully there is some quite detailed documentation available for the 8660 in which they explain it. So to summarize, the keys are scanned sequentially, 10 times for numeric data, then 10 times for non-numeric data. This is accomplished by clocking flip-flop U17B every time the D output of divide by 10 U25 is active. The Q and Q bar outputs of U17B determine which of the U20 comparators is being stroked, etc, etc. So that makes about as much sense to me as a pair of plies on a pig, so I had to pester Harter, who also does those force curves and an upcoming Hall Effect beam spring keyboard, for days before I could bring all the insane techno babble down to my level, so again, thanks for the help mate. Anyway, first the easy bit, the basic construction. The keys sit in rows of five units in very simple plastic mounting racks. The keycaps use a long stem to poke through the hole in the middle and a shorter retaining stem which keeps the slider in place. The retaining stem also interacts with the clicker which is this plastic thing here. As the stem slides past it, it peels off and then it shoots away causing a slight clicky noise and a small but sharp tactile bump. It's not very sturdy though, the clickers have partly broken off on almost all of them and some barely even click or feel tactile anymore. I mean, it is a thin piece of plastic after all. <laughs> Anyway, the big slider prong pushes down on this sheet thing with individual movable brass platelets, which are connected to a single communal ground. And below that sits the PCB, which consists of 20 pairs of spirals, one pair for each key, and the back of the PCB has them as well. Now this is where the fun starts. The way it works is almost too bizarre for words. Each switch has two pairs of spirals, one pair at the front of the PCB and one at the back, and each pair of spirals forms an inductor and each pair of inductors forms a transformer. Now the real kicker is that the switches are also wired up in pairs, as you can see in this diagram. The zero and SWP width keys are paired up, for example. Furthermore, each switch is represented as a transformer, as that's effectively what it is. Now what happens here is that this multiplexer, called U26, is responsible for strobing each key pair in turn to scan for key presses. So let's say it selects this line number 1, marked 4, to scan the 0 SWP with key pair. The strobe then goes through both transformers, where it induces a current on both other sides of the transformer, and then goes to ground. This other side, which I've marked in purple, is the sense line. This feeds into two lines of U20, which is a comparator, which measures the current on both lines. This is the part that detects whether a key is pressed or not. So going back to the PCB, this is what our switch pair 0 SWP width looks like in the flesh. Both switches consist of a pair of spiral pairs, let's say SWP width consists of A plus C, and switch 0 consists of B plus D. Now this is where it gets a little bit tricky because I'm representing a 3D stack of spirals with a 2D image and the layers are interconnected via these dots as well. Anyway, as we saw earlier in the circuit diagram, the pairs of switches share a single strobe line as each pair is multiplexed in turn, and this is what we're going to follow now. So as we go from multiplexer U26 to ground, we first go through the bottom coil of SWP width, which goes into the middle and comes out on the other side on C, and then goes through that coil and then proceeds to coil D, which is connected to coil B, and then it goes out again into this strobe outline, which is connected to ground. 
but wait, it gets even crazier. As the current goes through strobe coils A and C, it induces a current into the other coils on A and C. And as current going around in a loop generates an electromagnetic field with a direction that's most conveniently remembered via the right hand rule, this counterclockwise rotation of current generates an electromagnetic force that's directed out of your screen in this case. This results in a voltage plus V on sense line out 1, which goes into one half of the comparator. However, as the strobe current makes its way through D and back out through B, it generates an electromagnetic force that's opposite in direction into the screen, because the switch pairs are wired in reverse direction, so sense out 2, wired to the other half of the comparator, sees a voltage minus V, which means that the two voltages cancel each other out and the comparator doesn't see anything, which is how it knows that no key is being pressed. Note that all the switches on the board use the same sense line, all it does is multiplex through different strobe lines to clock each pair in turn. However, when you press a key, let's say SWP width, you push that metal platelet on top of the coils. This plate causes an inductive short, which means that the potential difference is taken away in that switch, which in turn means that that switch can no longer induce the red current and therefore outward magnetic field and plus V potential on the sense line, which means that only minus V is left on the pair of switches. So by measuring only the voltage of switch 0, the comparator knows that the other switch, SWP width, is pressed. The inverse happens when you press the zero key. The plate shorts the induction from the right side coils B and D and only strobe induction through A and C generating plus V and comparator U20 is measured. So it knows the other key, zero, is being pressed. This also means that the keyboard must have been capable of only single key rollover because if you press both keys, induction through both pairs of coils is impossible and you'd end up with zero plus zero is zero total voltage, which is the same it would measure if you didn't press either switch. In fact, if you held one key pressed down and then pressed the other, it would probably stop registering the first key. So basically, after comparing the hyperconjugated lone electron pairs on A and C to B and D, you get alpha-beta resonance of the quantum cycles on both strobe lines and then discombobulate U25, which is connected to six hydrocoptic marzal veins, sends the Lotus O delta waves from the strobe resonator and sends a signal to Michael acceptor U17B, which subsequently engages the photon torpedoes at warp speed. I hope that all makes sense. Now, you might be wondering why on earth this was all done in such an incredibly convoluted way, and it appears to have been mainly for the sake of reliability and durability. This thing being so old, it would have been an expensive piece of kit, and buttons not working could have been an expensive field repair, so probably that's why they went with it. Although I don't have an MTBF figure, I suspect it would take hundreds of millions, possibly even billions of key presses for it to die. The same inductive principle was used in the analog inductive MX switch idea by wooden keycaps from late last year, who used PCBs with very similar coil systems printed on them, except he uses the principle in a different way and is altogether a lot less convoluted than this HP thing. It's also not that dissimilar to the magnetic valve switches ITW made, which I explained in similar nauseating detail in my review of this Zenith SWA4300 keyboard. That one also works by completely bonkers principle. If you like the technical bits from this video, you really ought to give that video a watch because <laughs> it's pretty batshit. As for the build quality of the rest of the module, well, it was part of an integrated unit and again, it's from the early 70s, so you'd expect it to be pretty stellar. And it is. <laughs> My proxy, Ben, described it as a boat anchor, and yeah, considering this is really just a control panel, at a little under 2.4 kilograms, or as they called it when the first amphibians came into existence, 5.29 lubs, it is fucking massive, Christ on toast with butter and marmalade. It also has the advantage of coming with just about the thickest keycaps I've ever seen. They're around 3mm thick, give or take, roughly the same as Fujitsu's old caps. Man, these things are just like tiny little boulders of double shot ABS. I love them. <laughs> It's got some interesting legends on the keycaps, such as megahertz and gigahertz, and of course sweep width, as we know from the technical explanation, but also some cool rotating knobs, such as this two-stage knob, which can be adjusted both below and above.
although I've obviously not given it my usual week of testing and day-to-day -day operations when just trying it out like this it feels pretty cool. It's very inconsistent because those clickers have partly broken off on most of them, but it's a quite nice sharp key feel on those that still do work. Sounds pretty good too, would be cool if these had been used in a genuine full-size keyboard. That's it for this review, thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed it, and following is a video of me just pressing some random buttons on this thing so that you can get a feel for the sound.